Welcome back to Demystify Sci. I'm Shiloh. I'm Anastasia. Today we are cracking open the topic of quantum computing. Very exciting. Which is something we have heard a lot about, but know very little about. And so today is an opportunity for us to try to understand the nitty gritties. How does it work? How is it going to be applied towards tasks in the future? Is the juice worth the squeeze? And in general, is quantum computing going to be something that is like, you know, fusion technology that's always just around the corner? Or is it going to be immediately useful in some of the tasks that, that we're already approaching with computation? And it seems like the answer is yes and maybe. Um, there's some immediate applications in terms of encryption that we go through. And there's potential utility in terms of solving complex particular complex problems that aren't available with traditional commuting platforms. And our guide for that exploration is Professor Stephen Gervin, who is something of a super boss in quantum computing. He essentially developed the approach, the theoretical approach to quantum computing that allows for totally in chip systems of quantum computing so that you don't have to actually hold individual atoms still. Um, he also has co-founded a, a integrative initiative at Brookhaven National Labs that tries to put different pieces of the engineering pipeline uh, together in one place so that at each level of abstraction in design of a computer circuit, there is a, a collaboration, a cross-conversation so that the whole system can be viewed at once in some sense. And that's really fascinating. Which is something that I think we tend to take for granted as just being the case for computer systems that we already use, right? You open up your laptop, you log on to the internet, you send an email, you watch a video. It just kind of works. But all of it works because there's people that get together in rooms and they're like, this is the protocol that we're going to use and this is how it should be designed in order to be most effective. And Computer systems that have been around, the conventional systems that have been around for a really long time, have over the course of decades iterated these standards and made them functional. But quantum computing is just really starting to become a reality. And so all of these standards need to be defined in a new stack for that application. And so it's really interesting because... It's kind of the rebirth, in some ways, of a system that already works really well, now being ported to a completely different type of hardware that requires a completely different set of abstraction layers that are built on top of it. Yeah, so we get into all of these engineering issues. We also get into some of the basic physics, because this entire project revolves around the concept of quantum spin, which is, of course, one of the most poorly understood phenomena that is still practical, obviously. And so we're going back to the original experiments that detailed quantum spin and trying to make sense of that. And we spend a good deal of time piecing that together. And I think we make some progress. If you like what we do in general, consider coming over to support the show to patreon.com slash demystify sci. With your monthly donation, it means that we are able to operate this podcast without having to have external sponsors or without having advertisements. I have dedicated myself to watching a YouTube channel that I don't particularly like, who will forever remain nameless, but I discovered something really gross. He was advertising a service called Consensus AI so that you can go and search scientific topics and this AI search engine will give you back what the consensus says about the research. It'll tell you what to believe. You don't have to think. You don't have to think. You don't have to read the primary literature. And I'm like, it terrifies me that a program that is about science would be reduced to pasting advertisements for something like that onto it. This is an advertising free space. We're not here to sell you something. We are here to provide a service. And if you enjoy the service, come over to patreon.com. We have a weekly patron chat where we get together and we're learning what a, a brand new community of people with shared interests look like. We sometimes actually have guests from the podcast that come by the patron chat. It's not uh, terribly frequent, but it has happened before and hopefully will happen more in the future. Uh, you get both episodes early and you get to live with the sweet satisfaction of supporting something that you love and you want to see more of in the world. So come over patreon.com 
slash demystify. And you get early access to ticket sales, which are very limited for our conferences that we put on, looks like every year at this point. And uh, we are very close to announcing ticket sales for our Portugal conference, which is a crisis and cosmology conference. And we're going to have some phenomenal super bosses on deck for that. It's also just going to be beautiful. We're going to be hanging out on the beach in Portugal. And so if you want to have a better chance of getting one of those few tickets, I think we're only going to sell 50 of them. Uh, come over to Patreon and get inside while you still have time. Yeah, patrons get first access to that. Um, if that is not in your real house, you don't have any spare cash, times are tough, that's totally fine. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Discord, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Leave a comment, give us a subscription, uh, rate and review the podcast wherever that option exists. Tell your friends about the podcast. Anything that you can do that helps spread the word that you have found a really interesting forum where people talk about interesting ideas, that'll help us out a ton. You can also drop a name in the comments. If you have somebody that you think we should talk to that you'd really like to see, let us know. That helps us immensely as well because a lot of our suggestions come directly from you guys. Yeah, I think you guys are going to love this one. Uh, tell us who we should talk to next about quantum computing because I feel like we're just scraping the tip of the iceberg. But yeah, enjoy the conversation and we'll see you guys next time. The scientific revolution starts now. I'm Steve Gerben. I'm Sterling Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Yale University. I'm a theoretician, but I work unusually closely with experimentalists. Uh, they let me into the lab, but they don't let me turn any of the knobs. <laughs> um, yeah, so quantum mechanics is a, um, yeah, not something one has everyday experience with. So, so let me just start with some history and maybe some vocabulary. Uh, so mechanics is the study of how things move, basically. And um, we talk about classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And classical mechanics was um, invented uh, um, more than 350 years ago uh, by Galileo and Newton, primarily. And it Descartes always gets the short end of the shrift with this. Nobody ever yes, mentions Descartes. Well, there Poor are guy. Many, there are many French uh, <laughs> scientists and philosophers who contributed to this, and certainly Descartes and uh, Lagrange uh, were uh, key players. Um, and classical mechanics describes, you know, gravity, the motion of the planets, the moon around the earth, the earth around the sun, uh, footballs, baseballs, artillery shells, sailboats, you know, macroscopic objects uh, under the influence of different forces like gravity. And uh, it's a spectacularly successful theory if you um, know where the planets are now and you know about their gravitational force, you can predict with great accuracy where they'll be in the future. Um, if, you, if you launch a football with exactly the same angle and same speed and same rate of spinning, it will travel uh, on exactly the same trajectory each time. But it turns out that as successful as that theory is, it's only an approximation, a very, very good approximation, but it begins to break down in the world of the very small uh, electrons and atoms and particles of light, which are called photons. And there, um, strange things happen 
Particles act like waves. They're kind of fuzzy and spread out in their location. You're not quite sure where they where their energy is located. Uh, waves can act like particles. They carry discrete amounts of energy. Um, and uh, there are other strange uh, strange aspects of the world of the very small. And starting. Uh, this is just about the 100th anniversary of the development of the theory of quantum mechanics, which is perhaps the single most precise and best tested theory in all of physical sciences. Um, and it's able to explain uh, or make, I don't know about explain, we can get to, into that. Mm. But, but one is able to use the theory to make calculations that are extremely precise on what happens in this world of the tiny. And, uh, but there are some strange features that you, if you prepare a quantum system in exactly the same state and do exactly the same experiment each time and then measure what happens in some cases, the results are unpredictable. The theory predicts the probability of different measurement results, but it can't predict for you what the next measurement result is when you, when you repeat the experiment. So it's not uh, deterministic, unlike uh, Newton's theory of classical mechanics. Non-deterministic means that um, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen, only the, what the probability of different things will be. That sounds like a nightmare for a computing system to me. It seems like you would um, want everything to go exactly as planned, 100% right, of the time. Right, so why, why would I want to build a computer, or a quantum computer, based on the principles of quantum mechanics when um, when I uh, run a program and then I have to measure the quantum bits at the end to see if they're zero or one, and I get random results. Or equivalently, uh, there's this sort of uncertainty principle. Um, if I have a quantum bit, I can be uncertain whether when I measure it, it's going to be zero or one. That seems like a serious bug, uh, not a feature in, um, in trying to build a, a quantum a computer based on this kind of technology. And in fact, uh, this idea that the... Um, of uncertainty, and you can't quite be sure what the result is going to be, uh, just seemed generally bad, uh, period. I mean, uh, before the quantum theory, uh, if you had sufficient calculational power, you know, and you prepared an experiment, you could predict, predict the outcome. Uh, well, so the, so for the first, 70 years or 60 years uh, after the invention of quantum mechanics, which, as I said, is about 100 years old now, um, people uh, came to terms with this randomness and uncertainty, but it certainly didn't seem like it could be something useful that it could be a feature instead of a bug in the program of the universe <laughs> and could actually be used for developing new technologies. And, and uh, it's only in the last 30 or 40 years that we've come to realize that indeed there's much more to this quantum theory in terms of how you can transmit, compute, store information inside quantum systems. Uh, and then indeed, some of the strangest features of the quantum theory, this uncertainty and this uh, thing, entanglement, which Einstein called spooky action at a distance, that these things are actually useful. So for example, you know, uh, 
truly random results, random numbers are actually useful in computer science for various purposes. Um, and and the fact that this one of the like strange, encryption or something is that what you're pointing at? Yeah. So okay. one one of the strange features of quantum mechanics is that when you look at a system, when you measure it, the act of observing it can change its state. And uh, if you don't look sort of correctly, you can get a random result. And that turns out to allow for new kinds of encryption of information for uh, uh, a privacy enhancement in communication, if you will. And was that the initial motivation for these systems, or was it was it performance based at all originally, or were people thinking about new encryption systems originally? Well, um, trying to think of the exact order of events in the history, but um, there were the maybe the earliest thinking was the following: it was about not about encryption but about computation so uh you know there were several early players but Feynman is frequently um given credit for pointing out that in order to study a quantum system if all you have is a classical computer um you need to solve the equations of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation that describes uh, the evolution, you know, the dynamics, the motion of quantum things. Uh, you need to solve that equation. It's very simple to write down, but it can be complicated to solve if you have uh, many particles, many degrees of freedom involved. Um, like in a molecule of all the electrons. Um, and so it's known that such equations can be very difficult to solve accurately on classical computers. It can be done in principle, but it's difficult in practice for technical reasons. And Feynman sort of was the first person to really make clear the notion that if you had a computer that operated based on the principles of the quantum theory, uh, it could be very good at sort of naturally solving the equations of quantum mechanics. And is that just because you, the system obeys the equations of quantum dynamics and so you can just measure it in order to be able to kind of almost not quite spatially but substantively represent the solution of the equation with some state where it's not really yeah. a conventional calculation exactly I so see. um so he's basically like just like make a system and then look at it and then it'll solve the equation for you right so, so you know the sort of the sort of silliest example <laughs> is if you wanted to you know, solve for the properties of iron, you could start with a piece of iron, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. but, but in fact, you know, we're limited in the things that we can measure about that piece of iron. We can hook wires up to it and measure the electrical conductivity. We can shine x-rays on it and measure where the atoms are. But we it's very difficult to really get into the details of the complicated quantum state. Uh, because, you know, it's a kind of, I mean, it's, it's not even an analog simulator. It's just literally <laughs> the thing, the piece of iron. Uh, <laughs> Kant is, very, is, is losing his mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> but so uh, that doesn't, you know, like, uh, you wouldn't say there's nothing you can do there that kind of constitutes explanation. Uh, yeah, so that's actually something that would be interesting to to, to go into. But I don't know if it's too soon. The yeah, idea that's... of like description versus explanation. But well, I... let, let me let me just amplify slightly on that, and so we s clear what the question is. So, um, 
So suppose you had a quantum system, let's say a programmable quantum computer, uh, and it's not literally a piece of iron. It's you know a collection of quantum bits, qubits of some kind. It could be sodium atoms or superconducting circuits or all kinds of quantum objects that can be the qubits. But you have a way of controlling each and every quantum object, each atom, if you will, and changing its state and changing how it interacts with its neighbor. So you can program it to act like a very good model of iron or a very good model of, you know, different kinds of magnets or different kinds of interesting quantum systems. And such a programmable simulator allows you to do experiments in the simulator. It's like doing an experiment, right? You set up this quantum state and you let it evolve in time and then you measure something. But you have much more control. You can prepare exactly whatever initial quantum state you want to study. And we have ways of measuring what each and every quantum object in the simulator is doing. So we can, we can learn things that are just impossible by studying indirectly by bouncing x-rays off iron, for example. Uh, so that's, it's, it's a kind of uh, faithful experimentation. You know, people talk about digital twins and other contexts, uh, classical computing contexts. It's a way of uh, doing experiments in a controlled system uh, with a model which uh, you get to tweak the parameters of until it matches the behavior of iron or whatever it is you're simulating. So in terms of the the evolution of computing systems in general. Uh, let me ask a couple of clarifying questions to make sure I have this model correct. So is, uh, is what part of, this is going to sound so dumb, uh, what part of the computer is the quantum computer? Is it the CPU? Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, so sometimes we call them QPUs to distinguish okay. from CPUs, uh, uh, quantum processing unit. But, uh, you know, to understand the nature of a quantum computer, uh, you should think of it as some kind of a, you know, black box that has quantum stuff inside. <laughs> and it's completely surrounded by and tightly coupled to a classical computer uh, uh, that gives it inputs and receives outputs. That's good uh, because that's roughly the model that I have for CPUs as well. So it's not too much of a jump. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, for example, uh, just to date myself in in. <laughs> In the olden days, uh, before, so we have GPUs, for example, right? Uh, graphical processing units that are very, very good today at sort of specialized tasks, you know, multiplying big arrays of numbers, basically. Uh, they were invented for computer games, but it turns out now physicists and biologists and other people are building giant arrays of them because they're very good at fast calculations similar to the ones that are used to uh, rotate images as your race car is going around the track and stuff. Um, so they're kind of special processing units that receive jobs from CPUs, return numbers very quickly, you know, so it's like a subroutine that you call from a program. And, you know, there, before that, there used to be uh, things called floating point accelerators. If you had a, a Sun Microsystems computer that only did integer arithmetic uh, and you wanted to multiply real numbers instead of integers, you would call, you would send the job to this accelerator unit that would do the job and return it to you. And uh, you should think of a quantum computer as a kind of 
accelerator unit, that specialized thing that can do certain tasks very well and other tasks not very well. And then your surrounding classical computer decides if it's cleverly programmed uh, to send the, the parts of the algorithm that are hard for it and easy for the quantum part mm. to the accelerator and get the results back. Okay, and so you kind of started to answer the next question that I had, which was, if we look at the progression of the processing units of computer, where you go from CPU to GPU and now QPU, yeah, what are the fundamental theoretical, like on a high level of abstraction, what are the fundamental differences between the three types that enable them to to do the things that they do? Is that is that an answerable question? <laughs> you said we had three hours? Let's see. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Because so, I can get, I can give you my like my like super dumb model of it and you can tell uh, me if it's if it's totally off the mark. Where I'm like, okay, so CPUs to me, I imagine are are generally more linear. With GPUs, you enter into the ability to do higher dimensional calculations. And then with QPUs, this is the part where I'm like a little bit fuzzy still because I don't have a mental model of, I think maybe it's just even more higher dimensions because when we talk about something like an atom, there's like, you're, you're no longer encoding zeros or ones, you're encoding this entire stack of properties where each position has a multiplicity of possibilities associated with it. Is that? You know, that's not, that's not bad, actually. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so CPUs are kind of general purpose um, widgets that can fetch numbers from memory, pass them to an arithmetic unit to add them or multiply them. And, you know, they have sort of semi-specialized things. Like if you give it a long string of pairs of numbers to multiply, it can kind of do that a little faster than just one at a time. Uh, a GPU does some specialized arithmetic. If you have a large list of numbers and a giant array of numbers, uh, a matrix, you, you know, there's some arithmetic operation where you multiply one into the other and get another list of numbers. And they're designed to do that single task extremely rapidly. It's a, so it's a linear algebra task, if you will. And that particular task has many uses. If you if you have, um, uh, an, um, again, in a computer game, an image and you want to rotate 30 degrees to the left, or meaning you want the image to rotate the other way by 30 degrees, it's very fast at helping you calculate what this should be on the screen next. Um, and in a sense, yeah, QPUs are kind of uh, one step above that and being able to do uh, kind of met lots of arithmetic sort of in parallel uh, in a, in, in, and um, you know there are, uh, there are shorthand things uh, that you can say which are wrong but are short <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, my friend uh, Scott Aronson will, goes uh, ballistic when he hears the following phrase, which is very short and wrong, but it is short and pithy, that uh, it's not that you're uncertain whether the bits in a quantum computer are zero and one. There's a sense, not really correct, that they're both at the same time. And therefore, you you have um, kind of many things going on simultaneously in parallel inside the quantum computer. Uh, that's, that, you know, that's not strictly correct. Um, or, or maybe I should just say it's not correct. Uh, <laughs> but 
it it's very hard to describe what really is correct. Um, what really is correct is that that the bits don't have a value until you measure them. The act of measurement brings the value into existence. And there are experiments you can do, actually, which Einstein kind of helped us figure out. Uh, you and, and eventually John Bell really did figure out that there are experiments you can do to prove that if you assume that something has a value before you measure it, you can do an experiment to, to uh, get a contradiction to that assumption. Uh, and so you have you have this kind of potentiality of getting a certain result when you make a measurement, but there's no value yet. And then the purpose of a quantum algorithm, most quantum algorithms by start by having you put into the computer, into the input register, a giant superposition that sort of... Uh, superposition of all possible states you could ever put in the input from zero 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 to one 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 you know exponentially many possibilities and the algorithm has to take all of those potentialities and mm, sort of interfere them the way waves uh interfere you know if you have two waves and the the crest of one is at the trough of the other, they cancel out. Whereas if the crests are aligned, the wave is bigger. And the bigger that wave is, sort of the higher the probability that you'll see that bit pattern. So you want to do some of this kind of wave-like interference to get rid of all the wrong answers and amplify the right answers. And it's just a completely different and not very intuitive way of computing. And, uh, and yet it allows for, in certain cases, pe people have figured out very clever algorithms. For example, the most famous is Shor's factoring algorithm, which can defeat the RSA encryption. Uh, to do things that are just literally impossible on a classical computer, and it's not because it has a the quantum computer has a faster clock speed. That typically they're much slower than classical computers, but the the paradigm of how it computes is completely different, and um, the you know. Computer scientists talk about the complexity of a task. If you have a task of size n, so there's a database with n entries, or there's n equations you have to solve, or some way of measuring how many things you have to do, and the time to solution for difficult problems grows exponentially with n. Uh, but that's assuming it's a classical computer the details of which don't matter or the programming language some computers are faster or slower but computer scientists can prove that uh you know it's just exponentially hard to solve certain types of problems and for a few of those problems quantum computers the, the degree of difficulty grows more slowly with problem size say uh, not exponentially, but what they call polynomially. And so eventually, for a big enough size, even if the clock speed is slower on the quantum computer, it will win the race. That's interesting. So do you see the future of this technology as always being a part of a... It be, always being embedded in a classical system, like it will be really good at doing this one thing, but perhaps won't outright complete, uh, replace uh, traditional computing structures. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I mean, you need a classical computer just to kind of control and run the 
the quantum computer and get the data in and out. And um, it's um, provable, it's a theorem that the most general thing you can do in terms of computation is a kind of hybrid quantum classical computation where you you create a quantum state you evolve it in time insight with your algorithm then you make measurements on some of the quantum bits and from those unpredictable measurement results your program branches you know if this you measure this bit and it came out qubit and it comes out one you should do the following thing next or if it came out zero do something else and that kind of hybrid quantum classical computing is the most general uh thing that you can do to in, in any uh any physical kind of computation. So in terms of converting this into a next generation encryption system, you set up the, like, how does that work? So you have, you have two ends of an encryption pathway, right? You have obviously the lock and then you have the code to break it at the other end. How, how does, do both parties have quantum computers in such a transaction? Uh, yeah, good. So let me let me just back up for a second to set the picture. So I mentioned Shor's algorithm, uh, which can break if we could build a large enough, well enough functioning quantum computer could break the RSA encryption protocol, which is why uh, uh, everybody's busy switching. Which is why the U.S. government is so interested in developing. Exactly, them. exactly, and why these so-called Post uh, quantum encryption methods are their classical encryption methods that we think quantum computers can't break. So RSA is this public key encryption system, which is based on a security is based on the difficulty of solving some math problem. Namely, uh, it's a so-called one-way problem. If I give you two giant integers. You can multiply them, you know, on your cell phone in a fraction of a second. If I give you the giant product of those two, uh, let's say, prime numbers, and ask you to factor it into the product of these the original two numbers, find the original two numbers, that is believed, although not proven, to be um, uh, exponentially hard. For large, you know, if you have large, if you have two thousand bits in your number or something uh but uh shore's algorithm uh, uh will is able to find uh, the prime factors of giant numbers like that very efficiently uh, we haven't done it for large numbers yet because quantum computers aren't big enough and don't um don't work well enough yet but in principle uh they could so that sounds like it's uh, bad for privacy, bad for, you know, uh, defense. But it turns out that there's a different kind of encryption where you don't send classical bits uh, from the two protagonists, which are always called Alice and Bob in the literature. Uh, so Alice wants to send a message to Bob, and she uh, she could send uh, classical bits, you know, on a piece of paper or pulses of light on an optical fiber, whatever, so different ways of communicating. Uh, and the problem is that there can be an eavesdropper who could listen in and um, and capture the message. So, uh, but it turns out if you send quantum bits, the pre the eavesdropper has to um, measure them on the way by to see what they are. And the act of measuring can disturb their state. 
in such a way that Bob and Alice will be able to detect the eavesdropper. Mm, it's like a tamper-proof lid on on a on a medicine bottle or something. Yeah. Like okay. That. I hadn't. Thought, that's a very good analogy. Yes. Uh, and um, the protocols work because Alice and Bob are not actually sending the secret message. They're trying to establish what's called a, a key, uh, a one-time pad, which is the, the only provably secure way of doing encryption. So if, if Alice and Bob have a truly random sequence of zeros and ones, binary numbers, and they, sh- they, n- they share the same list somehow, uh, then you can use that list of random numbers to uh, encrypt the plain text message that Alice wants to send to Bob. And then Bob can, um, knowing the secret key that was used to do that encryption, can decrypt it. Well, the problem is, uh, how does Bob get the secret key from Alice if he's not physically nearby, uh, well, she has to send it to him. But that's the problem we're trying to solve, right? So so it turns out that if you send the key as quantum bits in a certain way, uh, and if you discover that there is an eavesdropper because somehow... uh, the tamper-proof lid is loose or something, (laughs) uh, so to speak, then, uh, yeah, the eavesdropper might have gotten some information. But now Alice, but it's only about the secret key, and Alice and Bob are not going to use it to send actual, um, you know, the actual plain text message in encrypted form because they know there's an eavesdropper there. Mm. Well, yeah, this is this is a very uh, specific and and different instance of the application of this technology from the one that I often hear people who are outside of computing that imagine quantum computers will be these incredible devices that can you know perform computational tasks. Like I often hear that, like well, once like this, uh, it will be married to the artificial intelligence revolution in such a way that it will make the computers so powerful that, you know, that will be the linchpin to artificial general intelligence or something like that. But I've I've also, yeah, I've been like kind of suspicious of that too, because I've heard whispers of people I know in Silicon Valley who've worked at these quantum computing firms and have ended up leaving kind of dejected, feeling like they weren't actually working towards that goal, perhaps. And that, or that, 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 uh, achieving that goal did not seem to be within reach for these systems. So the application of encryption makes a ton of sense to me. Yeah. Now, th- I mean, there are, you know, there are companies that will sell you turnkey quantum encryption systems uh, today. You know, they have some limitations in terms of uh, bandwidth, how many encrypted bits per second can you send and so forth. Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, so to go back to quantum computing, as you were doing, um, you know, I said that the algorithms had to do this very special thing of of modify, interfering these wave-like features of quantum states, of, of qubits, to kill off, destructively interfere and kill off the wrong answers and amplify the right answer. And it turns out, you know, we don't know how to do that for a general problem. And in fact, uh, uh, while we don't have perfect understanding of the um, the kind of complexity analysis that computer scientists have done for traditional computers, where the hardware itself didn't matter at all. Uh, Now, uh, that fundamental theorem of computer science is broken by, because it turns out quantum hardware is actually different and changes the classification of difficulty. 
but we don't know that many quantum algorithms and you know it's pretty likely that large classes of problems that are um, very hard for classical computers will also be very hard for quantum computers. Um, Interesting. Can you, hand, can you elaborate on that? Like, is well, uh, you know, um, okay. So there's a task that we know is easy for a quantum computer. If I give you a quantum state of you know, 35 electrons in some molecule, I tell you exactly what the initial state is. And I tell you, you know, how they, the electrons interact with each other and have, uh, et cetera. You, a quantum computer, if we could build a large efficient one, would um, be able to evolve that state forward in time and predict future not measurement results, but probabilities of measurement results um, very efficiently, exponentially more efficiently than a classical computer could. So in terms of commonly known applications, this would be like molecular dynamic simulations, which right now are run kind of as like particle models where you basically have, you model waters, you model your protein, everything bumps together. They also take forever. Right, I remember running. Yes. These, yeah, we yeah. were running these simulations in grad school that week, you just set right? them up, yeah, and like let them run all week long or something. Yeah, it's insane. And yeah, but the, the it, but it part. gives you some like version of what the system will do, right? You guys were simulating water inside of spore cortexes. I've seen people simulating it for you know like the the, ab, the enzyme active sites and rate of reactions and things like that. Right. So all, you make all kinds of approximations in such molecular dynamics codes to treat everything classically, that the, the atoms have a definite position and the energy, you know, the interactions between them, are they attracted or repelled? The way you should find that is by solving the quantum equations for what all the electrons are doing to see whether their energy goes up or down. Uh, but in practice, you typically say, oh, I'm going to fit the interaction to some phenomenological form, uh, uh, some function of radius that I specify in a lookup table or something. Um, and even then, it takes it's very, very slow um, calculations. So the... Uh, so I think your analogy is approximately correct that it, what I was describing of starting with some initial quantum state and moving it forward in time, that's a little bit like a very efficient and much more accurate first principles version of molecular dynamics. Which is why hand, people imagine these things as like God machines, right? Because like if you imagine a significantly large enough quantum computer in which you can encode enough states, then all of a sudden you have something that can actually tell the future. And that's like very spooky and cool and interesting. But I think that the problem is, is that you'd never really be able to build a large enough quantum computer that can do more than like a molecule. Uh, right. It would be extremely difficult and you would have to 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 solve the equation specify the initial state perfectly <laughs> and um we don't necessarily know how to do that but um the the so that anyway that's an example though if you if you specify the initial state a you know a theoretical initial state you can evolve it forward in time uh, but if I ask you a different question, I have a I have a, a drug target and I have a, a a prototype drug molecule. It's got you know lots of atoms and lots of electrons, and it's supposed to dock in a certain way on a certain site to activate or deactivate something in the target. Um, you know, kill. Uh, kill a cancer cell or turn on the gene or whatever the task is. Um, 
So we want to predict, we want to find drug molecules which uh, bind strongly specifically to this site and not others, and then have some right, correct properties. But finding the binding energy, like I don't know the state, I have to try all kinds of configurations and states to find the lowest energy one that corresponds to them being bound together. Um, that actually, at least a computer scientist would say that, uh, a quantum computer scientist would argue that that is provably um hard even for a quantum computer now what they mean by hard is there exist instances of problems in this category uh, that are hard not that every example of such problems is hard and uh what what do they mean by that well you know you could have um Weird, you could pick weird interactions among the particles that would make it very difficult to find the, the lowest energy state, the so-called ground state. Well, but, you know, the interactions are actually, you know, rather easy to write down. They have a lot of structure. They, they, the Coulomb interaction falls off in a nice smooth way with distance. It's not totally random. And so it's not completely clear exactly how hard these problems are for a quantum computer. Furthermore, uh, you know, let's take optimization problems. So, you know, um, airline scheduling, crews, planes, routes, fuel supply, weather, all these things, very, very, very complex uh, task uh, to optimize the probability of being on time, the lowest fuel costs, you know, et cetera, crews obeying union rules and federal regulations on how long they have to sleep between flights. There's tens of thousands of constraints that have to be satisfied. And um, uh, those are very, very hard problems. There are companies that do this for the airlines, um, and it's a huge computational task. And even though computer scientists will say this is a, an exponentially hard problem, there are companies that make money solving these, maybe not exactly, maybe not finding the absolute optimum, but rather quickly finding a very good optimum, but you can't by an algorithm which you can't prove actually works. And so this is these are heuristic methods. And this is just barely beginning to be explored for quantum systems. If I if I study some optimization problem that a computer scientist says could be in the difficult a difficult class even for a quantum computer. Uh, people are just now beginning to be able to play with quantum computers as they come online and experiment with heuristic tricks, um, which they've been doing for 75 years with classical computers and having good success. Uh, so I'm even if uh, uh, some problems are technically out of reach for quantum computers, they may actually in practice be uh, uh, have advantages when run on a quantum computer using heuristic methods yet to be developed. Good enough for jazz. Cl close enough. It, it, it works in practice, but right, you right. Know, perfect you is know, the enemy of good. You can't prove in theory that it works, but if it produces pretty good solutions pretty quickly, uh, it can be practically very useful. Hmm. What are you thinking? Um, all right, I'd like to kind of dissect the qubit itself and try sure. to make sense of spin flipping and stuff like that. I, I, I asked you uh, in the pre-show if you might uh, explain the Stern Gerlach experiment to us because uh, many have tried and failed on this show before. So, uh, and I know that's in some sense related. So, can we just talk about what a qubit is 
That's, sure. I mean, we've kind of alluded to it already with the wave function and so forth. Sure. Let, let's unpack that a bit. Yeah, so let's start with a, a bit. A, so there are two meanings to a bit. One is a theoretical concept, a kind of measure of information. If if I answer, if I give you the answer to a yes, no, or true, false question that you had no idea what the answer was, so you're that's complete surprise when I tell you the answer. That constitutes me transmitting one bit of information. But bit is also used to represent the physical object, you know, the magnetic core memory or the transistor switch that's on or off the magnetic uh, core memory that's magnetized up or down, some physical system that has two states which you can distinguish and which can be used to embody or store uh, one bit of information. Which is, also, and classically, it's ultimately limited to an atom, I suppose, right? If you look at people who are trying to push the limit of these chips, they're they're coming down to the atomic level. They'll have individual atomic layers, and that's right. kind of that's kind of the barrier to progress. It seems like yeah. So that's that's um, uh, the the switches that can be in state zero, meaning open, and state one, meaning closed and carrying current, uh, are very tiny transistors, which, as you say, are getting just about reached the limits of what they can, as small as they can be. So there are these so-called FinFETs, which are um, uh, uh, special kind of transistor, very, very tiny, just, you know, a uh, few atoms thick in the, in the thinnest direction. Uh, and they are, um, you know, you, you can't get smaller than one atom, that's for sure. Uh, but even at the current scale, you know, they have little insulators in them, and the insulators are only a few atoms thick. And quantum mechanics is already causing some problems because the electrons that are supposed to stay on one side of the insulating barrier and not leak to the other are actually waves, and they can tunnel through this forbidden barrier and get to the other side. And that's Part, that's not the majority of where with causing the heat that's liberated in your in your processor, but it's it's a it's a piece of it. And uh, so Moore's law that which is not a law of physics but a law of economics that these things would keep shrinking and shrinking is now coming to an end because we're running at, starting to run out of atoms. Basically, the atoms are becoming discrete units that. Uh, we can't make smaller. So, so is quantum computing and the qubit attempting to circumvent this barrier in some sense? Or, well, there are different technology platforms, and one of them involves using individual atoms to hold the qubits. So, there's some. Um, there's either a nucleus or an electron that acts like a little bar magnet, and it can be up or down uh, and store uh, a zero or one, represent a zero or a one. That's the ultimate um, sort of size limit of having a single atom. They're not packed cheek to jowl. They're actually kind of far apart from each other, held in place with little, what are called optical tweezers, little beams of light. Um, in in ion trap computers, they're individual atoms that have lost one of their electrons, so they carry a charge. And uh, again, they're they're not real close to each other. They're they're microns apart, a thousandth of a millimeter apart. Um, but they are down to, they are indeed down to single atoms. Do you have two, uh, do you, if you ha can look at both the nuclear spin and the electron spin, do you have potentially two levels of information that you can access from a single atom? Yes. So, uh, there's a lot of interest in this kind of stuff. Uh, uh atoms, don't necessarily have only two levels. They could have 
you know, seven levels in the nucleus and two levels in 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 a valence electron or something. And you you know you can make what are called q dits instead of q bits. Where dit the d in dits uh, is two if it's a qubit and uh, fourteen if it has uh, fourteen levels and so forth. And that that can be advantageous, uh, but um, you know, let's say you had uh, 32 levels. Well, th an object with 32 levels has as many levels as five qubits, each of which has two levels, because two to the fifth power is 32. So you gain a little bit, uh, and there are some technical benefits maybe of having higher levels. You can do certain operations on the atom more easily and so forth uh, or you can do a little error correction but it's not uh like hugely advantageous not exponentially better or something um it seems like you would also have to build a lot more of a detection apparatus if you're trying to detect 32 levels yes, of activity right. in a single atom and so the quantum computers that I've seen already look extraordinarily complex, and so adding even more detectors into that seems like it would just, you'd you'd very quickly yeah, get exactly. back to like room you, you size. You need computers. a detector then that can resolve thirty-two different states in one object and tell them apart. Whereas if you had five qubits, which all together have thirty-two states, you get to measure five things, and you all have to do is it zero or one. For each one and that's easier in a sense you're you're absolutely right but the fundamental difference here is that in the classical computing bits they're in a defined state you, you set yes. them in some yes. defined oh. state i mean this so yeah please please right so right so so far we we've really been talking about um so a bit can mean information or it can mean the thing that carries the information and classically it's this physical object. The switch is either open or closed. It's representing either zero or one, but not both. Mm -hmm. uh, a quantum bit it is weird. If you measure it, if you ask, are you zero or, or one? The answer is always yes. It's either zero or one. But there's an infinity of states, a kind of continuous um, family of states called superposition states that are intermediate in some sense between zero and one. And mathematically, we represent them by, 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 an, by an arrow. And the arrow, if it's at the North Pole, is zero. And if it's pointing down at the South Pole, it's one. And if it's anywhere else on this sort of, think of it as like a point on a sphere, there's a latitude and a longitude that can vary continuously. So it's kind of like an analog computer that it, it stores information in a continuous way. And yet when you measure the qubit, like if it's pointing this way, if you say it's pointing up, you measure it, you'll get zero every time. If the qubit state is pointing down, it, you get one every time. But if it's pointing on the equator, it's 50-50 random whether you get zero or one. If you're kind of near the North Pole, you mostly get zero and occasionally get one. So it's, it's this weird combination of analog and digital. It's so hard for me to grasp how something probabilistic could encode information because it seems like it's encoding mystery more than anything else. <laughs> uh, well, there's a, there's a weird asymmetry between what you can encode and how much you can decode. Hmm. It takes it... So if I tell you that this arrow is pointing uh, 32.70159662 degrees away from the North Pole, and that's the co-latitude and then the longitude you know is the angle uh 
you know, like on the Earth, the longitude going around this way, I give you a 12-digit um, longitude. That takes many, many bits, formally an infinite number of bits, because there are two real numbers involved there. So it takes an infinite number of bits to in specify a particular quantum state. But when you measure it, you only get one bit. The zero or one. Zero or one. Now, it turns out you can measure, like, is it pointing vertically? Or you could ask, is it pointing horizontally? Or some other, you know, it's an infinite number of things you could measure. But when you choose what you measure, the answer is always zero or one. So there's this weird asymmetry, uh, which between what you it takes to encode and what you get when you decode. And that's that asymmetry is is helpful in quantum encryption, by the way. That's part of how it works. So if I if I uh uh take a quantum state with where the arrow is pointing horizontally and I don't know that, so I say I'm gonna measure whether it's pointing up or down, I will find it pointing either up or down. When I measure it, I will get a zero or a one, and the state is now changed to be consistent with the measurement result. It's no longer pointing this way. It's, it's pointing in one of the directions I was measuring. And that's how the eavesdropper uh, can mess up the, the secret key that Alice is sending to Bob in the encryption protocol. Okay, so if the only way that you can tell the direction that it's pointing is by measuring, and if yep. measuring always resolves either to zero or one, and you don't... Like, when Alice or Bob measures, it would still resolve to zero or one. So how do you tell if somebody has measured it along the way? Is it because ah. when Alice sends, she knows what the like where all of the vectors are pointing and yeah. So so let's just let's limit our attention to four states. Sure. Okay? Up, down, uh, left or right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I can encode zero and one using up and down, or using right and left. Okay, and Alice chooses, makes a choice. So she's going to send a random key. So she's randomly picked zeros and ones she wants to encode, but then she she encrypts them by randomly deciding to send them sometimes as up down and sometimes as left right. Okay, so now uh, let's say she sends uh, a, a zero. That's in the in what we call the X basis, the, the right, left, right basis. Okay, she sends that. Now the eavesdropper has to guess. Should I measure in the left, right basis, or should I measure in the up, down basis? Which question should I ask? And in quantum mechanics, it's very important what question you ask. So if this thing is pointing this way, and Alice guesses correctly that she should measure this way. The she eavesdropper, will, you mean? The eaves, sorry, the eavesdropper. Thank you. Will will get the right answer that it's a zero, and she didn't change the state. It came out of the measurement, the stern gerlach measurement, exactly like this, and she just passes it on to Bob, and Bob's none the wiser that she uh, learned the value of the bit. But there's a fifty-fifty chance that she might choose the wrong basis. And then the state is pointing to the right, and she asks, are you pointing up or down? And the answer is always yes. I'm either pointing up or down. And now the state has changed. She can't see that. She doesn't know it. She could measure it again. She'll get up, up, up every time. But the first time she measures, it could have randomly changed. And then she passes that on to Bob. She, she doesn't. There's no way she can tell that she changed it, so she just passes it on to Bob. But there is a protocol where Alice and Bob can compare notes to see that that change has occurred. 
And so basically, it requires having, because okay, so the way that I imagine this, so is, so many things. Um, is this basically working on the same principle as the Stern Gerlach experiment? Yeah. So so let's uh, yeah. You asked me to talk about that, and we didn't quite get there. <laughs> so the very first qubit experiment, although they didn't know that at the time, was done by. Um, Otto Stern and I don't remember Gerlach's first name in Germany in the 20s sometime, I think, 1920s. And um, it's very interesting. So they, they had a little oven and it, they had some silver atoms inside, a little bar of silver, and they heated it up until some of the silver evaporated and came out of the oven through a little collimating hole and made a beam of silver atoms. Uh, shooting across the lab, and they uh, and they had them hit a, f a a piece of glass and stick. Now, the thing about silver is that it has um, it acts like a, the the there's an electron in the silver atom, which is a lot of the electrons they have a. They act like bar magnets. They have a little arrow attached to them, like going from south to north pole, just like a qubit. And that, and that this magnet can be turned. This uh, the uh, of the the magnetic moment. It's called uh, of the silver atom can point in any direction. When it comes out of the oven, it's just a completely random process. Who knows which way it's pointing? But then they had a special uh, magnet uh, with funny shape. Uh, pole faces that uh, made a, a strong magnetic field with a with that got stronger as you moved up. And when the silver atom goes through that, if the if the uh, its little bar magnet is pointing up, there would be a force deflecting it upward, and it would hit the glass higher. If it was pointing down. Uh, it would come out and there'd be a force pushing it down because the two magnets, you know, when you magnets re repel or attract each other. And uh, if it were pointing sideways, then uh, basically it shouldn't go up or down. If it's partly up, it'll go up a little bit. So they expected to see uh, a pattern of silver atoms landing on this piece of glass that uh, some of them would be deflected up, some not at all, and some would be deflected down. And they did the experiment, and they couldn't see anything. <laughs> so, and then uh, one of them, I think Stern, had the habit of smoking vile, sulfurous cigars. And yes. Sherlock showed him the glass, and he said, I don't see anything. And he exhaled sulfur <laughs> from, his, <laughs> from his cigars onto the glass and silver sulfide is, turns black. So the sulfur reacted with the silver and there it was. They could see the, where the atoms had landed and something was completely wrong because uh, half the atoms went up the maximum amount and half went down the maximum amount and there was nothing in the middle. As if the little bar magnets of the silver atoms always pointed exactly up or down because that's what they were measuring. Are you pointing up or down? They thought. Are, are these atoms charged, by the way? Uh, no, they're not charged. They're neutral. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. So, so then suddenly uh, th there was something quantized. The orientation was not continuous but at least when you measured it, it was always up or down and that was the first totally shocking result they sent a famous postcard to niels bohr thinking that they had discovered um uh something bohr had predicted but actually they had discovered something different that electrons ha are these little bar magnets uh electrons or atoms well, the electron in the silver atom okay. uh, gives the silver atom its magnetic property, yeah. Okay, but so th intuitively, this makes sense to me, right? You have an atom 
that contains within it a fair amount of angular momentum, right? So it's rotating, it's moving. The 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 its magnetic moment is kind of pointing in all directions. Yes, yeah, it could. It, well, there's some random process, you know, when the oven launched the silver atom out. Who knows? It's probably pointing in a random direction, right? Right. And so the minute that you launch it in between these two plates where there's a, a, an applied magnetic field, it seems obvious that because it has momentum when it enters the space between the plates, that that momentum will carry it towards one plate or the other plate. Like, it just seems like a straightforwardly... Is, is that... Is, is that just like an the, elementary yeah, school interpretation? That, the angular or? momentum, the fact that it's... Spinning. Yeah, like, because yeah. If, if you if you could or, take... Or if you just treat it as a magnet, right? I mean... Well, it has to be rotating, because... It, so if, if you imagine that it's you have... Tumbling. It has to tumble, because if you have a magnet that isn't tumbling, that you can put in at three different states, which is up, down, or straight on, then yeah. you would expect that you get this distribution of three states. But if you throw a magnet in there that's just going like this, it has some kind of impulse to push it towards the south or the north the moment that it enters. And because the ah. experiment is designed in such a way that it pushes it either down or up, then obviously you don't get anything in the perfect center because every atom that enters has angular momentum. Yeah, so, um, okay, so now we, <laughs> we come to a slightly tricky point. So do you know about gyroscopes? Uh, probably not as well as I, I mean, I, theoretically, yes. I played so, with them. You know, yes. <laughs> so you have a spinning uh, bicycle wheel on, on an axis, and you and you you one end is is held up by a, on a pivot, and gravity is trying to make the bicycle wheel is spinning, tries to make it fall, but it doesn't fall. It doesn't move in the direction of the force. It moves at right angles to it and precesses around like this. And that's what the tumbling atom does. It doesn't move toward in the direction of the force. It just whirls around. Uh, that is to say, when I say it doesn't move, I mean the, the rotation axis doesn't turn in the direction of the force. Why not? Because, I mean, like a gyroscope, the reason that the, the gyroscope doesn't fall is because you're holding it. But if well, imagine well, that you're it... holding it only on one end, and if sure. it weren't spinning, it would just fall. Sure, but it is spinning. And so fact, if you were to take spinning. a gyroscope and you... So you take a bicycle wheel and you hold it uh, and, and you process. And so there's this, there's this anchor point where you are right. standing... Uh, you're like uh, sitting on a yeah. chair or something. I remember this from the exploratory when I was a kid. Yes. But the moment that if you had that gyroscope and you got it spinning and you just threw it in the air, it has all of its degrees of freedom. Like as it's tumbling in the air, it's just going to kind of like... Oh, randomly. it won't It won't tumble. It'll keep once you, uh, you know, if, if it's spinning in some direction, you just toss it. The direction in which it's spinning just stays constant. But if you... Okay, so in this... In this uh, so so let's let's distinguish two things. There's um, uh, the motion of the atom as a whole. It does go up or down um, due to this uh, some properties of the the magnetic the magnet that it's passing near. But the but if you calculate if it is a bar magnet or, or which is you know or an electromagnet because it's a it's like a gyroscope that has charges on it and it spins around and makes a magnet. Uh, the orientation of that magnet will not turn in the direction of the torque from the, from the external magnet. So you expect classically that if it's spinning, sort of pointing horizontally, it may turn and, but it'll always stay in the horizontal direction, and the the atom itself will not feel a force to move up as a whole or down as a whole. And so, the way that you would test this 
I mean, and I don't know, somebody might have already done this, but so basically if you have a small gyroscope and you throw it up into the air between magnetic plates, you would expect that the the direction of the gyroscope's precession would not be affected whatsoever by the magnetic plates. It would just kind of move laterally. Uh, the No, the... Uh, so if the gyroscope has a bar magnet on its axis, yeah, then when you put it near a magnet, the magnet will try to turn it like this. Mm. But the gyroscope, because it's spinning, won't turn like that. It'll slowly precess at right angles to that. And so the the magnetic moment never ends up like this, which would cause it to physically rise or like this, cause it to fall, it, um, it, the, the, the vertical force on the atom as a whole just depends on whether the thing is pointing more up or more down. Uh -huh, but, but sideways, it's, it's neither up nor down and it doesn't change to up or down. And so you expect it to go straight through and hit the glass at the same height that it started at. But, but that does uh, not it seems happen. like the, the crux of this is that atomic spin is not a simple gyroscopic motion, right? It, it has a very bizarre symmetry to it, which requires this double rotation to return to its original Well, that's state. true, but for the It's almost like a precession, a precessing... Uh, uh, it, it's complicated, yeah. right? There's there's very few but physical the models. The equations of this. for the quantum precession are identical to the um, to the classical precession of a gyroscope. It turns out hmm. um, the thing that's the thing that's different about the quantum spin is that a state where the spin is pointing sideways is actually a superposition of up and down. And those two possibilities of being up or down uh, cause the silver atom to split and go into two directions, both up and down. But when it hits the glass plate and sticks, it can only be one of those. It collapses to either being in the upper place or the lower place. But do you see what I'm saying? Like, it seems like the reason we can't ascribe a physical mechanism to that is because the angular momentum associated with quantum spin is different than like a top spinning or something like that. There, there's, there's a bizarre symmetry to it, right? Yes. Um, for for a top spinning, you can say, "Oh, it's I can measure that it's pointing twenty seven degrees away from vertical, and it's you know I can I can measure all those things, and the act of measuring it doesn't cause it to end up in some other direction." Well, the, oh, okay, so we've talked but about if this. I if I take an electron spin, which is just like a gyroscope, and I measure whether it's pointing up or down. With some probability, I will find it up, and with some probability, I will find it down. Pardon the interruption. I have to ask you for a very quick favor. If you enjoy the podcast and you like what we do, come over to patreon.com slash demystify I've already told you all of the excellent things that you will get as a benefit for this, but I will just reiterate once again that we cannot do this without the support of our listeners. We appreciate every single one of you that comes over and are happy to see everybody who listens show up at patreon.com slash demystify we're going to a lot, we're approximating the world that, that these spin vectors can only be in up, down, left, or right. And you're allowed to ask one of two questions, but not both. Are they pointing up, down, or are they pointing left, right? So in the first uh, example, up, down is, is what I call a Z measurement. And if you have the, air, the spins are up or down. They pass through the measurement unchanged. And if it's, if it's up and it's the stern garlic experiment, it, it, it physically moves up. You don't see these little arrows. They're invisible. But the, 
but the motion of the atom because it hits the glass plate in a certain place, you can see where it hit. And that tells you which way the arrow was pointing. Uh, again, same thing if it's pointing down. So uh, if Alice sends these to Bob and these are the measurements that Bob makes, he correctly learns what Alice was sending him. Uh, but if uh, Alice is sending Bob uh, uh, in up down bits and Bob measures, are you left or right? The answer is always yes. It's either pointing left or right. The state changes and the result is random. Sometimes it points to the right, sometimes to the left. The state has changed because Bob met, asked the wrong question and uh, Bob uh, cannot tell that he has affected the state with his measurement. Similarly, the other way around, if you send left-right states through uh, a left-right measurement, they go through unchanged. But if they're pointing to the right and you ask, are you pointing up or down? Sure enough, they're pointing up or down and they've been changed by the act of measurement. And it's a completely random and unpredictable result. And my friend Sasha Karatkov likes to say, uh, you know, the, the random result is not because it had a value of, let's say, up or down before you measured, but the the, it's not that um, you see what you get, you get what you see. You, the, the, the actual seeing is what um, gives the spin a new orientation or the bit a new value. So when, you, when, when it passes through this measurement box here on the slides that we're looking at, the measurement is the application of an external magnetic field? Um, in the stern gerlach example, yes. In the case of different kinds of qubits, it's some other, it's morally equivalent to that, but technically different. And so the the difference, and this kind of comes back to the, the conversation that we were having before the break, which Shail and I were kind of rolling around a little bit. And what it really comes down to is whether or not you can model the motion of atoms and electrons as gyroscopes. And I've never heard that before. And Shiloh made an interesting point, too. I, I was just thinking, when I, when I was studying quantum mechanics many years ago, and we were studying Dirac notation and so forth for spinners, I was always under the impression that you couldn't treat a electron spin as a classical rotation, that it had this 720-degree rotational symmetry that made it somehow privileged. Yes, that's that's true. Um, when I said that the equations uh, for which way the spin is pointing, the, how that processes are identical to those of a gyroscope, what I meant was that the average value, the expectation, value, the average value, averaged over many experiments, you would see exactly the same thing. Mm. I didn't specify that, sorry. Um, uh, but so you would, for example, if the spin is horizontal and it processes, uh, it would stay horizontal, but, but when you measure whether it's up or down, um, it would be 50-50 all the time. And if you were able to, if you were able to measure, they say the left and right, uh, you would, you know, if you averaged over many measurements, you would get the average orientation is exactly the same as for a classical case, but only on average. That makes sense. But I, I suspect that, that yeah, point. that makes perfect sense. I yeah. just, I mean, I don't think we're going to solve this today, but I suspect that the nuance of how 
the difference between that classical precession and the quantum precession, if we're able to somehow understand what the actual surface of that, I mean, the electron is the surface of the atom for all intents and purposes. And if we were able to grok what it's doing, we might have a better understanding of why this stern gerlach binary phenomenon plays out the way it does. In other words, like it kind of gets us back to what's the difference between a description and an explanation? Well, a superposition is a great description of the state of that system but it's not necessarily an explanation of why it's behaving the way that it is. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, so there's, um, you know, as I, so there are different <laughs> schools of thought here. Uh, everybody agrees on what equations you have to solve and what the predictions of the quantum theory are. If you specify exactly how the experiment's done uh, and you don't make any mistakes, just, following the recipe uh, for what quantum theory says to calculate, you will predict very precisely the probabilities of different outcomes for the experiment. No, Nobody disagrees about that. Um, but then, uh, I mean, sometimes we get confused and make mistakes, but it, well, it's not hard to finally get it figured out and, and do the right thing. But but that's just sort of, um, you know, what Feynman called the shut up and calculate school as a recipe and it works. And it, the recipe is very strange and weird that, you know, uh, a, a, an arrow pointing to the right is a superposition of arrows up and down. I mean, what does that even mean? You know, uh, so there's no... Um, the, not a heavy area of research. What does that actually mean? Doesn't well, doesn't, it doesn't seem necessarily technologically productive to ask such questions. Exactly. I mean, yeah, that's right. I mean, people have opinions. They have crutches that they use to kind of visualize and get intuition. And if they're careful, you can use different pictures carefully and and kind of intuit the same answer that the calculations are going to give. But no single picture very simply describes all the weird phenomena. <laughs> Fair enough. Recipe is pretty straightforward, but you know, trying to figure out how to assign meaning to it is is not so easy. Do you think that being able to assign meaning to it would get you to the next level of system design, though? Because this is a I, this is a thought experiment that I came up with a long time ago, where I was thinking about biology, which is a really heavily physical discipline. Right? We we think about genomic information as being stored in the DNA. There's this process of like reading it and translating it and. Yeah proteins are affecting actions and i was like okay well what if biology was just purely mathematical what if we just had equations that described the information content of the genomic field and then we had the like algorithmic pro the, the algorithmic uh, rna field that was applied to it that did some transformation of that information and then it was placed into the protein field which also yeah. trans like how far along would we be in biology if that was the extent of the intuition that we had about it? Would we have molecular medicine? Would we have discovered cloning? Would we have, would we have CRISPR-Cas? Would we, or would we just be kind of still operating in the sense of, you know, the statistical population genetics and the weird because uh, there was a um a school of like biometricians that was very popular right around the time before the first experiments started to show that there was heritable material and their attitude was like we don't we don't need to know what's down there we can calculate roughly how traits are produced in the population sure there are some surprises but those surprises can be kind of cludged into position and so we can figure it out it happened that they were like really pro-eugenics and various other unpleasant things and so they were kind of swept under the rug as uh as physical models for what was happening in the cells appeared and people started to figure out heritability but like p-values and and statistical tests still come from the biometricians who are like we just need yeah statistical stuff yeah so yeah that's an interesting question i mean i think um 
absent um, absent a kind of microscopic model for how a, a SNP, a, a, a little error in the in the DNA encoding, produces a specific error in the protein, which um, manifests as a particular disease or, or deformity or whatever. Uh, it seems difficult to imagine interventions, you know, using CRISPR to snip out that little particular thing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or, or it seems difficult to come up with ideas to do gene therapy on individuals when you have some hints from population studies, sort of average statistical properties, but um, having some, you know, notion of the particularities of individuals seem and, you know, seems very <laughs> uh, more powerful than just having statistical correlations. Well, there's this guy that posts on Twitter, and I don't know how he does this, but he will draw pictures using math and not like simple pictures. Like, for example, the other day he posted, I drew this feel, I drew this picture of strawberries using math. And then he has the equation down below. And it's this, you know, like paragraph long equation that gave him this pic. I can pull it up and I can show it in a second. But so there's this clear breach between the visual information content of the picture of the strawberries and the information content of the mathematics. And it's like, they're both saying the same thing, but they're saying them in such radically different ways that one is parsable as object strawberry. And the other one is yeah. only parsable at this really high, like, I, I don't think anybody can yeah. visualize those equations in their heads. Like right. you require a computer to actually translate it to be like, oh, this is, this is drawing right. a picture of a strawberry. And right. so I'm like, is, is quantum physics at that point, still right now, where the mathematics is there, it's parsable into something that works, and yet we are still kind of operating with this pictureless expanse of something that very few people, if anybody, has a real image in their minds when they think of it. Um, well, I... I think that's not the case. I think um, I know what you're driving at, and there's some there's a kernel of truth in it. But I think the way I mean the way we make precise predictions is we solve the equations, okay? But the way we think about uh, gosh, there's a new way to uh, there's an interesting new state to create, or there's a new algorithm. It's all done with pictures. Hmm. Most physicists uh, operate with some kind of pictorial, um, I don't know whether they're crutches or, or how to describe it, but we're, we're not just like, we're not solving the equations in our head. <laughs> uh, and we, we have kind of, intuitive pictures carefully honed by you know going and developing the picture then solving the equations seeing if they match up in terms of you know prediction uh so you you can't do one without checking against the equations but a lot of people wow uh, a lot of people uh have very visual thinking about quantum states and the waves that represent them and so forth, um, which are, are kind of backed up by checking against the standard shut up and calculate recipe and making sure that it, it's uh, aligned. Because... So you can you can actually you know there you can and with years of practice, <laughs> uh, you can develop intuition for these strange quantum phenomena and use it to think of new kinds of experiments or new kinds of 
things to do, uh, algorithms to run, etc. Interesting quantum states to measure uh, based on that intuition. Uh, but that, but you know, what it kind of gives you an idea. Then you you confirm the idea by checking the equations, see if they say the same thing. Oh, go ahead. I actually don't. I don't know if there's a straightforward answer to Nastia's question. Like, would we have molecular medicine and stuff? I think there's actually a pretty good case to be made that we would still, even if it was purely schematized. I, I just don't know that it's a clean cut answer. Is the truth of the matter? Like, I think that math is extremely productive technologically if we've learned anything. The question is, like, is there more to science than technology? Like, is there just you know, can you have a curiosity-driven science that asks questions like, what is the mechanism by which this physical system plays out? Like, can we come up with productive visualizations? And maybe the productive visualizations do lead to more technological progress. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, I... You're, 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 you know, you're trying to s go off. And th the main thing is to come up with a good question. And... um you know, you you don't always do that by just playing around with the equations. You develop some pictures. You you have some flash of insight that says, "Oh gosh, this picture suggests the following weird thing would happen if you did the experiment this way." And then you either have to check the experiment, or you have to at least check the equations and predict what the experiment should give you. And uh, the equations are very complicated, and having having some visual pathways that you've kind of figured out work for you, I think is very helpful. All right, before we move on from the Stern Girl, can I ask one kind of stupid question that's uh, been bothering me? Uh, I might never have a chance to talk to somebody about the Stern Girl hack experiment in this <laughs> level of depth. You're evaporating these silver atoms off yeah. of this, with this oven. Why are the, how, how do you collimate a beam of evaporation? Like, how do you get that? to even form a beam? Oh, you just have, um, it's a closed oven and you have a pinhole that they can pass through, but they'll, they'll probably go out in all kinds of directions. I see, I see. So you have another pinhole downstream and they have mm. to be going through, lined up just right to make it through both holes. Okay, pretty simple. All <laughs> right, all right, that makes perfect sense. But because atoms are waves, if you make the holes too small to try to too perfectly collimate them, the waves will diffract mm. coming out and spread out again. So it's uh, it's very much like a like a pinhole camera. It's kind of interesting. Hmm. Tricky. All right. So okay. So I I understand how this spin process is used then in calculations and encryption. Uh, I mean, it still seems like a very difficult business to do calculations using a, a, a fuzzy system like this and. That might be beyond the scope of what we're going to accomplish today. Maybe. I mean, don't... Uh, if you have some kind of superposition of states in an atom that's being used as a qubit, doesn't it have a tendency to like spontaneously resolve into an up or down even without you measuring it? Like, is there some... Is there some percentage of states that collapse just kind of accidentally uh yes uh and this is a big problem for we have to, an engineering problem for quantum computing building um if you don't have to measure the state or observe it to change it the environment can interact with it and change so you know when you throw a football the reason it doesn't look like a wave and this fuzzy and spread out is all the air molecules near it are kind of measuring where it is because they have to get out of the way and they develop turbulent flow and so forth. Uh, so um, uh, you want the quantum computer to sort of be completely in the dark, completely decoupled from the rest of the universe, uh, which is why particular version that we build at Yale has to be cooled down near absolute zero. Um, and, and, and so that there's no tendency for this effect of an eavesdropper, like the environment, some 
part of the environment is eavesdropping on the state to change it. Uh, and then at the end, you suddenly want to strongly couple the quantum computer to your measurement apparatus to see what the result is. And having a huge on-off ratio between being decoupled from the universe and then suddenly strongly coupled to the rest of the universe is uh, an engineering challenge. Uh, also, you want to, you know, to execute the quantum algorithm, you have to take a bunch of classical data and use it to, to rotate these arrows in complicated ways during the algorithm. And that requires talking to the outside world to you know, get that to happen. So it's a big engineering challenge. And, and it, the, lead, the, the current quantum computers are very small and very crude. They have you know, fewer than a thousand qubits. Um, and that's not really the limitation. Uh, the limitation is that the qubits become entangled, they get observed by the environment and tend to lose their quantumness to sort of collapse. The superpositions get changed in random ways. Uh, rather rapidly, I mean, uh, you know, in some technologies, it's every... Uh, second in some technologies it's every millisecond um and we need to learn to do quantum er this causes errors we need to learn to do quantum error correction to make the state stay quantum for a much much longer time and that's the current grand challenge which we're just beginning to learn how to solve now what are some approaches to that? Well, suppose, so uh, error correction is used all the time. It's not so important in, in modern computers because the chips make errors rather rarely, but it's very, very important in cellular telephony, for example, because, you know, a cell phone only produces a fraction of a watt of power and there's lots of noise and interference and so forth. Uh, so there's a so there you have to use a kind of encryption, and basically it's um, a kind of redundancy. So a really dumb, simple way to do redundancy is to send the bit. If the bit is supposed to be zero, I'm going to send you a zero five times. That's pretty expensive. It takes me five times longer. But now you look at all those and measure them, and if the majority of them are zero, you assume that it was supposed to be a zero. That's a simple classical uh, error correction code called the repetition code. There are much more sophisticated, sophisticated codes, and there's a chip in your cell phone whose only job is to take strings of 100,000 bits and transform them in a special way, adding some redundancy to encrypt and then decrypt uh, as it's sent. Not so much for the you know encryption to keep it secret, but rather to add this redundancy uh, so that if there's some noise which flips some of the bits when the cell phone signal is traveling through the air, uh, or or your your noise in your receiver flip some of them uh you can still recover the original message quantum error correction is much more subtle so in addition to um uh a bit flipping from zero to one uh, it could have been in this superposition state and suddenly it's in this superposition state that's called phase flip and so there are more kinds of errors and as we've just been talking about with the stern gerlach experiment and Eve eavesdropping on messages, if you measure a state to see if it has errors in it, you yourself may accidentally change it. And you'll have no way of knowing. So 
Qu inventing quantum error correction codes is a subtle art. And to me, the fact that it's possible is much more amazing than the fact that you could do quantum computing, actually. That you could do quantum computing while fixing errors is, is totally amazing. Uh, and again, one of the first people to do this was the same Peter Shore who invented Shore's algorithm. And uh, the idea, I told you that, that like quantum information is kind of analog because these arrows can, you know, point anywhere. But they're kind of digital because if you ask, are you pointing up or down, you always get this or that with some different probabilities. So there's a very clever way to use a code, which when you make some very subtle kinds of measurements, they don't tell you what the bit value is that's being stored. They only tell you whether there was an error or not and what it was. Mm. So imagine, I mean, when I have an analog system, errors, the states are continuous. And the errors are continuous. And every configuration, you know, of the gears in an analog computer, they're all allowed. So that you have no way of identifying what's an error. But fortunately, so it sounds like you couldn't do this for a quantum system. But fortunately, when you measure a bit, you get a discrete result. If you ask, are you up or down, you get zero or one. And there's a way to very cleverly write a code and then take a very clever measurement, which gives you either a zero, there was no error. Even if there was an error before, when you looked, it wasn't there, so it's gone. <laughs> and maybe there was a tiny error and your measurement got a one, then there's a discrete error. So Errors are continuous, but measured errors are discrete. And then you know how to fix them. And you get around this no-go theorem that you can't correct analog machines. So it's very subtle and amazing and interesting. And we're just learning how to do it in such a way that the error correction process, which itself makes errors, is starting to work well enough that actually it's making things better instead of worse. All right, so how does uh, circuit quantum electrodynamics play into what we've been talking about so far? Because you're credited with coming up with some of the underlying theory that yeah, makes all of this my possible. my experimental colleagues, uh, Michelle Devere and Rob Sholkoff and I kind of uh, developed this about 20 years ago. And... Uh, so um, this is, so electrodynamics is the study of the interaction of atoms and electrons with electromagnetic fields, radio waves and light waves. And uh, there's a whole field of quantum optics where you think about, oh, the electromagnetic field is, you know, electromagnetic waves are actually particles. They're photons with lumps of energy, and you can count them. Uh, so those things that sometimes they act like waves, but when you measure them, they act like particles and so forth. And they interact with atoms in funny ways. And that's a well-developed theory. And we took, uh, we sort of stole all those ideas and, and applied them to microwave electrical circuits that are made uh, with superconductors. They're cooled down to near absolute zero, so there's no uh, resistance. And you can have charges sloshing back and forth in this circuit for very, very long times with no, almost no dissipation. And that motion is kind of like the excited states in, in atoms or um, uh, electromagnetic waves. So, uh, so these circuits work at a, and the gigahertz frequency range, the microwave range, the same as your cell phones work. So we have to kind of shield them from the, the world mm. of the cell phones. Uh, but they, we can- Is build... that just a thermal property? It's just, that's, that's the frequencies that result from these super cooled systems? 
Uh, oh, okay, good question. So we can build certain circuits containing gadgets called Josephson junctions, which which act like artificial atoms or synthetic atoms. They have uh, excited ground state, first excited state, second excited state, discrete excited levels, just like traditional atoms. But in natural atoms, the, when the electron is um, up here and falls down and it emits a photon, it's typically in the visible or even the ultraviolet. It's, it's a high, very high frequencies. The nature, the, these artificial atoms are much bigger than natural atoms. They're a millimeter in size sometimes. And they emit, uh, their excitation energies are about 100,000 times smaller than natural atoms. So they, they emit and absorb microwave light, microwave, you know, radio waves, rather than visible light. But we showed in amazing experiments that, uh, you know, microwaves are actually particles. They contain photons, lumps of energy, just like the lumps of energy that trigger the rhodopsin molecule in your retina to change its shape and send a pulse down the optic nerve and so forth. But just much, much less energy, but you can still count the individual particles. So... This kind of quantum optics applied at low frequencies, at microwave frequencies, turns out to be pretty interesting physics in itself. It's like quantum mechanics in a new domain. But it's also a very nice way to build an all-electronic quantum computer that uh, you don't use natural atoms and lasers and things. You you have, instead of a laser, a microwave signal generator that you just buy off the shelf and it it's, uh, sends microwave pulses down to your computer and executes uh, gates and chain, you know, carries out your algorithm or makes measurements of the final result of the computer and so forth. So it, it, uh, it resulted in the first sort of all-electronic quantum processor uh, which had actually only two qubits in it, but but uh, we we ran uh, uh, all possible algorithms that could be run on two qubits, of which is really only two, <laughs> in uh, at Yale in two thousand nine, I think. And uh, this sort of architecture has grown from there and been, you know. It's kind of become the industrial standard for superconducting processors and uh, uh, a lar companies large and small. I mean, IBM and Google and Intel and Amazon uh, and small companies like Quantum Circuits Inc., which is a Yale spinoff, are all using this architecture to uh, as a particular way to build uh quantum computers it's only one of several ways you know people using natural atoms are also having great success and making great progress uh, it's not the only way mm. and the natural atoms are with the optical tweezers since they were describing uh, yeah they're, they're with natural atoms you can build what's called an ion trap if you use charged atoms ions you can hold them in place with electric and magnetic fields uh, with neutral atoms, you can hold them in place with by focusing very tightly a laser beam down to a spot. And uh, if the color of the light is chosen correctly, the atoms will be attracted to the most intense, uh, the place where the light is the most intense. And that's, that's called an optical tweezer. And then you can move them around and take two of them that are far apart and move them next to each other and have them interact to do sort of if-then logic on the qubits and then move them apart. And they're starting to learn how to do uh, error correction as we are. They, they, have a, they have a different problem. So their, their atoms are very coherent. They, they, their superpositions last a long time, like even one second. Hmm. But that's because 
they, they're, they last so long because they don't interact very much with the environment or with each other. And you actually want them to interact with each other at certain key moments when you're doing operations and on the quantum computer. So they need error correction, not not for sort of memory. The memory will last a second, which is great. They need error correction on the gate operations, which aren't perfect. Does this tie into... We can do the gate operations very fast and very high fidelity, but the qubits still uh, you know, have errors just sitting there. So we need error correction for just memory operations to make the states last longer. So it, we're both facing engineering challenges, but but they're all you know they're different. So every, every technology has pros and cons. How does entanglement play out in these calculations? So uh, so entanglement is uh, a kind of superposition involving more than one qubit, uh, typically two at a time, and you can have an entangled state, which is a superposition of one up and one down and and the other way around. And, uh, and you can separate these guys long distances and they still have correlations between them that are stronger than any possible classical statistical uh, correlation. Stronger than can be explained by uh, the usual theory of probability where all probabilities are positive in quantum mechanics, they can be negative. <laughs> and uh, it turns out entanglement is one of the things that gives quantum computers their power. Uh, entanglement and superposition um, are the things that give quantum computers their power. And the weirdness of the implications of entanglement. And it, uh, Einstein recognized very early, that better than most people who, who worked on quantum mechanics. And he felt that uh, even though he had helped invent quantum mechanics, that there had to be something wrong with the theory because the, the implications of entanglement were too weird to, uh, to be sensible. And I, I'd like to say when I talk to students, you know, the, the, the great quantum irony is that every morning when the graduate students come in and operate the quantum computer, one of the things they do is the thing that Einstein said was impossible just to make sure that the quantum computer is working and it's quantum and not classical. So uh, entanglement, entanglement is very delicate. Uh, uh, you know, it's the thing that gives the quantum computer its power, but it's also its kind of Achilles heel that, you know, it can be the slightest measurement or observation of one of the partners in the entangled pair messes everything up. And so, again, we come back to uh, we need error correction. What do the graduate students do in the morning? Make sure that it's still a quantum computer. Well, uh, so uh, so you can entangle qubits, and then you can make some measurements in a style of experiment that was. Um, so basically, Einstein said there's this weird thing going on, and John Bell made it experimentally testable in the or came up with an explanation that someday in the future, this was in the 1960s, someday in the future when we have the ability to measure individual objects, we could do the, a certain test. So you can do certain experiment, make certain measurements, and there's no, you'll get correlations in the results which are impossible if probabilities are all positive numbers. I see. And, or equivalently, they're impossible if you assume that the thing you're going to measure has a value before you measure it. There's different interpretations of the same idea. The modern one is kind of that, the, the one I like the most is that uh, you can't assume that things have values before you measure them. And they, this is an experiment that you can do. And classical theories say a certain quantity has to be smaller than two. And quantum mechanically, it can be larger than two. And you just 
do those measurements and make sure that it's as close to uh, the maximum value, which is two times root two, square root of two. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we did, uh, we and uh, Yale and, and uh, also John Martinez uh, at Santa Barbara did some of the early uh, measurements of this violation of this so-called Bell inequality to show that you had true entanglement and this sort of spooky action at a distance thing. Uh, and if you can't do that, you don't, you either don't have a quantum computer or you don't have enough control of it, of it or the ability to measure it well enough to use it as a quantum computer. So what happens if the graduate student shows up in the morning and the quantum computer that was quantum the night before is now no longer quantum? Do you have like a protocol for jiggling it to become quantum again? <laughs> well, you you know, it's it's very easy to make a mistake in the experimental design or, you know, so do things happen in the dark <laughs> overnight also? Like a, one of the qubits starts to become noisy or misbehave in some way. Um, so typically... Man, you know, and I thought biology that experiments go, were difficult. <laughs> the typical thing that goes wrong is, you know, you wake up the next morning and your ability to precisely read out the state of the qubit has become less good. You sometimes confuse zero for one and one for zero. Or the qubit lifetime, the time that it stays in its coherent superposition suddenly got shorter because of some unfortunate thing that has happened. Uh, some uh, little bit of magnetic field has snuck in there during the night or something. Something's changed. And, you know, this ha this kind of stuff happens in experiments all the time, and you have to sort of diagnose the disease and figure out what's going on, figure out if you need to do, if it's happening a lot, you got to redesign the experiment so it doesn't happen. And this is, um, you know, experimentalists do a lot of, spend a lot of time doing plumbing and <laughs> other, you know, noise uh, elimination and things. I spend a lot of time looking for minus signs because I'm a theorist, but you know, which one is worse? I don't know. A <laughs> uh, totally unrelated question. Uh, how long is the average quantum computing PhD taking people? Um, about six years. But relatively standard. I mean, some, uh, you know, uh, typical PhD is about six years, which is more or less field independent, I think. I mean, it varies a little bit. I'm I'm relieved to discover that they're not spending, you know, like twice as long as normal because they're having to rebuild the quantum computer from scratch every time it becomes a classical <laughs> computer. I mean, it's interesting because as the field makes progress, you know, students can come into a huge apparatus that's it's got refrigerators and electronics and all kinds of stuff has been set up and there were some previous successful experiments on it. And they don't have to rebuild all of that. And there's a huge code base. All of these experiments are um, controlled by very high-speed computers that, and a huge base of Python code that um, previous generations of students have helped develop. And so you don't have to um, you don't have to solder everything together from scratch, so to speak. Uh, but you do have to. But still, you're going to do something new, and so um, uh, there's a sort of a lot of modules you can use. There's a module for, you know, run this and it will measure your qubits for you. That's fine. Uh, run this and it'll control your qubits for you. But now you have um, something that's different because you've rebuilt the sample or, you 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 know, it's set up differently. Uh, or, you know, you... Um, you realize, oh, you know, if I change this code, uh, when it sends the microwave pulses down, the system will be more robust against some kind of errors in the microwave generator. And there's all, just all kinds of things to worry about and improvements uh, to be made uh, to be made uh, as you go along. But it's not like, you know, 
I mean, 25 years ago, students were coming into an empty room and <laughs> we've got to get a fridge and we've got to order the microwave generators, you know, things, things advance. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different uh, depending on the, you know, things change as the technology advances and what it's like, what you have to do as a student. For sure. Yeah, I was I was hoping we could break out your crystal ball to to close this down and try to get a glimpse of how this kind of computing is going to change the future. Do you have a sense beyond encry encryption or even encryption applications that we might not have discussed, but who what what sorts of clients are are ultimately going to be interested in this technology and where yeah. are we going to start to see this appearing? Yeah. Uh well, that's a good question. I usually uh, protect myself by pointing out that the the people that invented the transistor and the laser and the atomic clock had no idea what they were going to be used for. So, fair, yeah, fair enough. I think uh, we may discover completely new uses for this technology that we didn't know about. But I, but still, I have sort of some guesses. Um, so I think it's kind of commonly agreed that probably the first customers, so to speak, of the computer, I'm just talking about computing now, will be people interested in doing quantum simulations. The thing we talked about at the beginning, um, programming your quantum computer to solve the equations of quantum mechanics uh, to describe some try to understand some experimental phenomenon that's been seen in iron or or design a new material that will have some interesting property and so forth because of the ability of the quantum computer to efficiently solve the equations of quantum mechanics so the first customers will be scientists uh interested in solving quantum mechanics problems uh, that'll be interesting and important, but uh, then there's a sort of different question. Who will be the customers and what will be the interesting problems that are economically interesting and, and uh, sort of pay for the huge investments that have to be made to get this technology to work? Uh, and that there the answer is less clear. Um, it seems likely that um, problems in quantum chemistry, you know, figuring out these, uh, 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 doing uh, virtual screening of different drug molecules to predict which one might work, which one might have side effects, that kind of thing could perhaps be uh, an early application. Uh, I think there's also, uh, you know, some interesting possibilities in optimization problems, which is an enormous market in, I mean, uh, you know, some people define engineering as optimization subject to constraints and what other life skill do you need? <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the, it's probably there going to take some of these heuristic algorithms to be invented as, as we were discussing earlier. Uh, and then I think it's probably generally agreed that the last area that will actually be useful is quantum machine learning, uh, things that quantum enhanced machine learning, things that require studying very large data sets uh, face a bottleneck because first we don't have yet very large numbers of qubits and second there's a bottleneck for getting large amounts of classical data in put into quantum states of qubits it requires um, a hardware structure or data structure called a quantum random access memory. So we don't know yet how to build that. We're working on it, but we, we don't yet know how to do it. Uh, so random access memory, uh, you know, you give, you 
you fetch data at an address. You give it an address, it comes back with the data at that address. Quantum random access memory, you give it a giant superposition of all the addresses at once, and it fetches each piece of classical data that goes with that address in superposition. That turns out to be incredibly powerful for um, as what's called an oracle for, for moving classical data or classical functions into the quantum system so you can do things with them, analyze them, do machine learning algorithms in quantum quantum ways. And uh, that technology does not yet exist. And because it involves huge amounts of data and huge numbers of qubits, uh we just we just haven't done it yet so uh so i've said what might be first <laughs> what might be in the middle and what's probably last uh but it, you know it's i mean maybe it's educated guesswork but it's still guesswork and what do you think is the biggest problem that needs to be solved soonest for the technology as it is right now to become more widespread? Well, my standard answer to that is fault tolerance. So, so I, I mentioned quantum error correction. We, the qubits are making errors all the time, or when we act with gates to do operations, logic operations, the gates make errors. And then we need to correct those. Now, uh, and I mentioned that error correction requires building in redundancy and doing some fancy measurements and deciding what errors to correct, et cetera. Uh, and the, the circuits that build in the redundancy and do the error correction are made of the same stuff as the quantum computer itself. So it also makes errors. The quantum error correction circuits themselves make errors. And if you can get, if you can correct errors successfully, even when your error correction makes errors, that's called fault tolerance. And the fact that that's possible in principle, theoretically, is quite amazing. Uh, and it is possible. So mathematically, it's been proven. There are you know, computer science theorems that have proven within reasonable models of how the errors work, you should be able to build a system that's fault tolerant. But doing it in practice is we're just beginning to learn how to do that. And that's the grand challenge, that if we can solve that, then... Uh, Scaling up to bigger sizes will be a big engineering challenge, but it won't really involve new physics. Figuring out how to make things fault tolerant is still a fund, you know, fundamental research question that we're just beginning to make progress on. Uh, so you you often hear, uh, especially from large companies, you know, uh, oh we have five hundred qubits, or oh we have. 800 qubits or whatever and people get focused on a simple metric of progress like how many qubits do you have and that's not unimportant i mean controlling 800 qubits with all kinds of signals and wires and it's very very complicated uh and and the lots of interesting engineering that has been done and will be done there but in some sense i mean the po our point of view is that uh, those are already too big <laughs> in the sense that um, the error rate is still high enough that you can't like fully entangle all 800 of those qubits. You can't run long algorithms with many steps because errors keep happening too rapidly. So rather than scaling up and then trying to figure out how to correct errors, we think that you should learn how to error correct first. Once that's working well, it's much easier and more sensible and more timely to then scale up. And that's not, scaling up is by no means trivial. 
but there's and it's useful to learn how to do it now even when we don't have error correction but if we don't end up with error correction there's no point in working at large scales and so is there some metric for uh like how many fault tolerant qubits are in existence or is fault tolerance something that doesn't work even when you only have like two or three qubits right because if, if companies are advertising you know we have 800 qubits or something yeah. Is it possible to ask the next level question of like, okay, well, how many fault tolerant qubits do you have? Yeah, that no, absolutely. And um, uh, with those, you know, the companies that have large numbers are just beginning to uh, take collect subsets of those several hundred qubits, you know, groups of ten or fifty, and taking 50 physical what we call physical qubits encoding them into an error correcting code to get let's say one logical qubit that's error correctable and lives longer than the best of its individual parts mm. so uh, error correction is a kind of collective phenomenon you want the the whole to be better than any of its parts and um we've we've done that um for error correction for memory operations using some novel error correcting codes that don't involve like physical objects like qubits but rather uh, empty boxes that contain some number of microwave photons to hold the information and we've gotten the lifetime to be uh, little more than twice uh, the logical qubit, little more than twice the best of the physical parts that make it up. That's better than being worse, <laughs> but we need it to be you know millions of times longer. And uh, we're above one, but we're way short of a million. Uh, some of the uh, Google has done some experiments recently where they have uh, looked at uh, encoding a qubit and like a logical qubit and like 10 and then 20 and then 50 qubits roughly and see that the lifetime is starting finally to get longer. I mean, a year ago it was kind of staying the same or getting slightly worse. So there is progress in this direction and a very important you put your finger on a very important metric um how many i mean you can you can take your resource of let's say a thousand physical qubits you could just use it as a thousand physical qubits that aren't very good you could use it as uh five very good logical qubits if things are working well or you could use it as 50 pretty good logical qubits you see there's like a, a a choice of how you uh how many physical qubits you use up to make a, a, a logical qubit and um th there aren't people are trying to think about what metrics to measure, yes, you have how many logical qubits you have, but how much better are they than the physical qubits has to be part of the metric. People are still thinking about, you know, what's the right way to quantify uh, how well you're doing in this direction. And it's complicated and still like kind of a research topic. But, but you asked the right question. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of questions that I still have. We're coming up almost on three hours, and I wonder if it doesn't make sense to to take a pause so we can kind of digest all of this stuff and read a little bit more. And I, I still need I have one last crazy oh, question. You do? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is it possible in the future to use this principle of entanglement to have some sort of decentralized computing where? instead of having a computer in one place that's disseminating information to end users, that everybody is participating. I know this is kind of happening right now through the internet, but is it possible to have an even faster version of that decentralized computing using this principle of entanglement? Yes, 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. The answer is yes. So right now, you know, there's sort of technical limitations to how big you can make computer chips. And so, you know, modern high performance computers are clusters of computer, small computers, and they're tied together by very fast communication channels with Ethernet wires or optical fiber or different ways. And uh, it's a tricky programming challenge to divide up a big calculation into little pieces that are done by separate processors, which then have to, once they're done with their little piece, they have to pass it to their neighbors or to, you know, there has to be a lot of communication, message passing, uh, to um, assemble the results or decide what to do next in the algorithm and so forth. But that's that's a, a fairly well-developed uh, field in classical computing. So, um, so suppose you now have um, a cluster or even two, let's just start with two quantum computers and uh, they only have classical communication between them. So what does that mean? Well, you could uh, uh, run an algorithm for a little while on computer A and then measure a few bits, qubits, and send those classical measurement results to the other computer, which would then change what it's doing based on that. And they would communicate back and forth classically. Uh, that's somewhat more powerful than twice one quantum computer but not much but if you have if you can distribute entanglement if you can have quantum communication between the two computers so they're actually entangled uh that's exponentially more powerful than twice one quantum computer and uh so and that you can quantify the the kind of gain that you get from that. Is it so possible you, to you're entang- exactly right that that you know if you use quantumly connected quantum computers, it's much more powerful. And is it is it possible to entangle um, atoms without bringing them physically into proximity with one another? Uh, yes. Uh, the the simple way is to bring them next to each other and have them interact in some way and then separate. But there are so-called remote entanglement protocols (laughs) where you use quantum communication. Maybe you um, use, depending on the state of this qubit, you send a photon through optical fiber to the other side, and you um, you can you can uh, communicate entanglement in that, or you can yeah. You sort of set up the state entangled. classically, almost like What's that? You, you you sort of have the computers attached remotely in a classical sense, but then you set up that initial state such that they're synchronized. Is is that what you're talking about? Um. Uh, no, so you want um, so so let's th- let's think I have two qubits that are far apart, and I want them to be in an entangled state, which is up, up mm-hmm. plus down, down. And I could make them up, up. That's easy. I just prepare this guy up. I send a classical message saying, "Hey, prepare your qubit up." That's fine, but I didn't make the other part of the superposition. <laughs> So you need some uh, uh, some quantum way of communicating, which will let you build that superposition so that you're up, up, and down, down, and you don't know which it is. Mm-hmm. And that that's a much trickier thing, but it is possible. Uh, there exist different protocols. Uh, uh, for communicating this uh, information, but you could imagine using optical lines or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. 
future is going to be wild. Looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, um, you know, we don't have any everyday experience with this stuff. And so we don't, it's not the only way, you know, we professional quantum mechanics develop intuition is by uh, learning the theory and then interacting with experiment and keep getting surprised until we get used to it. <laughs> and, and then we say, oh, now I understand it, but maybe all, maybe all it is is we're used to it. <laughs> mm, I like that. Yeah, this is, I, I, yeah, it's, it tires my brain out to think about these things because it's so foreign, right? This idea of making def definite calculations on a fuzzy system like this is just, it, it's so perplexing. And I, I'm starting to see how some applications could emerge from that, but it's a very different way of thinking about computation. Yeah, than, it's very different. Although, interestingly, you know, I've talked to people, um, you know, that, that work at, at, big software and hardware companies and they say you know you don't actually you don't have to be a quantum physicist to do this if you're if you're a very very gifted programmer and somebody explains the rules to you mm. you just view it as another weird programming language you get the hang of it and you start inventing new uh, algorithms and protocols but mm. you, know, you have to be pretty gifted but it is possible people tell me that's really important, actually. That that makes oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we need to expand the workforce, and we, you know, it can't be everybody. The only people that can do quantum computing are people that spent six years getting a PhD in physics or quantum computer science or whatever. We need electrical engineers, mechanical engineers at the bachelor's and master's level who. You know, they have to learn a little bit of quantum mechanics to see what the point is. But uh, we need to be able to uh, kind of translate the requirements that are needed into the language of mechanical engineering and signal processing and electrical engineering uh, without burdening people with six years of quantum mechanics training. This is going to be very, very important. Otherwise, we just won't have a big enough uh, workforce. Amazing. And I mean, that's kind of how it works now already. I feel like you don't really have to have a high-level understanding of how a CPU or a GPU works in order to be able to write a program that runs on it. Absolutely. Most computer scientists who aren't computer engineers have no idea how the computer actually works. They don't know what the electrons are doing, <laughs> which of course bothers me as a physicist. <laughs> but, but the great success of classical computing, because the hardware has become so reliable, I can just give you an abstraction of an abstraction of an abstraction of how it works. You can just say, oh, you, I'm going to set this bit to zero. And you don't, you don't know how it actually works, but you know you understand the line of code and and effectively what it means. You can use very high level languages. People, very few people write in assembly language uh, anymore, and uh, that's the goal we want to have for quantum computing. That we want to be able to design this full stack system that goes from bizarre hardware at the bottom to novel but maybe not so bizarre programming languages and applications at the top. And to do that is going to require a whole community of people who can at least speak the language of the layer above them and the layer below them so that, you know, you can simplify the abstractions as it goes up and people can just focus their attention on the algorithm or the application without having to worry about how the refrigerator works or what the electrons are doing and so forth. Because it's just too complicated to understand, you know, the whole stack by yourself. Do you think there's anybody that does? Uh, sure, that, you know... Uh, I mean, I kind of understand maybe the bottom half, <laughs> and I'm trying to meet the software and the programmers and the, you know, physicists are not typically systems designers. And unfortunately we have to learn how to 
talk to and partially become systems designers to to turn these things from physics experiments into real technology that works. And uh, so we need, you know, we have to be humble and get help from computer scientists and electrical engineers who know how to define standards and how to communicate between each layer of the stack as sort of abstraction that lets people do their work here without screwing up uh, the assumptions uh, down here for for how to make it work. It's pretty complicated, but the the classical computing world has figured out how to do this uh, over the last seventy five years, uh, and uh, and uh, do you know do what's called co design, uh, which is uh, uh, here's some hardware. Think about how the software would work on that. And then the hardware people are saying, can you just add this feature to the software? And the software people are saying, well, can't you just change the hardware this way to make this work? And we, you know, communication, uh, we co-design the each layer of the stack and hopefully get it to work efficiently. And that that's uh, really the important work that's happening now as we scale up. That's really interesting. Do you do you know if anybody is addressing the integration of abstraction layers directly on its face? Yeah, is there like oh, a, a theory of abstraction layers, or or a book, or is there is there somebody oh. who's dedicated their life to figuring out how to integrate that knowledge across the entire? In a way that's yeah, predictive. Yeah, so this is a well-developed thing in the classical computing world. Um. You, you know, you tell the hardware people, I'm going to interact with your hardware with the following, you know, signals or application programming interface, or, you know, so I'm going to define the standard. You do what you can to make it work. And uh, given this interface, talk to the next layer up. This is a very well developed process in the classic computing world. Uh, I'm a I was the founding director of one of the five uh, national quantum initiative um, DOE research centers in quantum computing that uh, uh, centered at uh, Brookhaven National Lab. And, and co-design is in our name. It's the co-design center for quantum advantage. And we're working with, we have physicists, uh, material scientists, uh, computer scientists. Uh, we're working with people as as 89 people in the, in the center uh, from many, roughly 25 institutions. We're working, for example, with people from Pacific Northwest National Lab who are national leaders on the classical side for doing co-design and uh, defining standards and defining abstractions. And we're, for us, in the quantum case, we're trying to learn from that, but we're still trying to it's still a research task to figure out how to define those kind of standards on the and abstractions on the quantum side, and that's part of the research that this center is doing. Um, and that's super um, I don't know if I can point to a good reference. Uh, what was it, what was the um, so the the center as a whole is doing this research? Yes, I see. And what's the yeah. what's the center called? Uh, C2QA is the acronym. It's the Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage, and it's uh, led by Brookhaven National Laboratory. That's really that's really interesting to us. Yeah, we have a friend who is a chip designer, and he's always frustrated by the lack of understanding between different abstraction layer compartments. I think that what he's I, this is really funny because he's he's mentioned abstraction layers to us a bunch of times, and I think that Shiloh and I come away from what he says with very different perspectives. But I think that what he wants is he wants a cohesive theory of abstraction layers so that you can look at the organization of one abstraction layer and then be able to predict the kind of math or operations or structure yeah. that you would use for the next one. To so translate could, to the next level. Yes, yeah, so you could start with hardware and then be able to, from first principles, be like, okay, well, this is the kind of structure that we would put on top of that. 
or start with the structure that's above it and be able to derive what the hardware has to look like down beneath it so that you could actually because i think that the idea especially for somebody who's a chip designer is to be able to go from something that's really high level and then iteratively step down yes. to the basics. And if you can't do that because there's not a cohesive theory that links one layer to the other, you're basically just throwing darts at a dartboard until you figure out what works. And that sounds expensive and exhausting. Yeah, exactly. So, you, you know, the, the theory of this is kind of uh, just keeping track of the information flow. Is there, is there uh, you know... The hardware people have some serious constraints, things they can do and things they can't do. And the software people can't ask them to do things they can't do. <laughs> and um, so, you know, kind of um, starting with a high level request, I want to be able to, whatever, fetch from 17 memory locations at once with no latency or something. I mean, there's some request has to get translated down and down into lower level languages and then finally into electrical pulses that actually operate the hardware. And you have to make sure that as you do these abstractions, you don't oversimplify, you leave out something that the, the message that oh certain things are impossible has to has to be passed up but it has to be described in a simpler and simpler way uh because the people at the top are experts at software and don't really know how the hardware works so it's a real um a real challenge but the, the you know as I said, there's a lot of work on this. It's still a research problem in classical computing, but there's been a lot of success in figuring out how, you know, the simplest example is an API, application programming interface. Um, I have some proprietary hardware. You have some Python code. I tell you, look, here's the set of instructions the hardware can execute, and here's the interface, how you tell it to do that. And here are the rules. Uh, and that uh, um, I can change the hardware to make it better as long as it still has the same interface. Then you, it's transparent to the user above. If I change the hardware, which requires completely reprogramming up here, because now I'm, I'm happy the hardware is running better, and they're unhappy because the software all stopped working. That's the typical problem you're trying to avoid mm. by uh, carefully um, uh, passing uh, these abstract fixed abstractions further up. That's really interesting. I think we should put a pin in it. We could keep talking, but I think that three hours of uh, brand new quantum computing mm -hmm. knowledge is about the limit to what I can absorb. <laughs> um I want to say thank you for taking the time to field all of our questions and for being patient with us. And I know you're a busy guy and I just, I really, really appreciate it. Ah, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I know it's kind of complicated, so uh, uh, it's, it's not easy to get these uh, novel ideas across, but uh, it looks like it's, you know, going to be pretty important. Where, uh, where where would people be able to find more about your work? Just lab websites? Are you growing your lab still? Are you, you taking new postdocs and grad students? Or uh, what's going on? Uh, new postdocs, yes. Um, I've been telling prospective students that, um, you know, I'm, I might be retired by sometime during their six years, so I should be a co-advisor rather than a, mm -hmm. a sole advisor. Mm -hmm. But I'm still... Uh, still having fun and 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 I am co-supervising a couple of students and several postdocs right now. Um, I have a web page, uh, uh, dot sites dot yale dot edu, and uh, that that has some videos of lectures and some lecture notes from my course on quantum computing, uh, which is designed for minimal physics knowledge you have to know linear algebra and complex numbers that's it so that's a for people that 
had know those things, they could get into the field uh, uh, by taking a look at those notes. Uh, you can uh, the Kiskit organization. Kiskit is a kind of mm, it's not exactly a programming language, but um, it's a uh, uh, more or less more or less a quantum programming language. Uh, and they have a whole online textbook uh, you, with examples and different kinds of algorithms you could learn that way. Uh, and you can run these examples on simulators of quantum hardware, hmm, uh, cool. which is a good way to kind of get practice with these things. Okay, so there are cool. quite a few resources uh, out there. Excellent. All right. Well, yeah, I look forward to seeing how this all shakes out in the future. And we'll uh, hopefully we'll be talking to Scott Aronson here soon, too, so we can uh, digest some of this and come back a little bit right. smarter. But yeah, I feel like I, mean, I have a you, much you, better grasp. If you ask Scott, uh, does the quantum computer work by the bits being zero and one at the same time, you can watch his head explode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write that down. <laughs> Fantastic. You can you can tell him I... I I told you to ask him that. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Gervin. It's yeah, been, it's pleasure. been a thank you. wonderful morning. Uh, thank you so much. Very nice. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.